morning, Sacred Exchange. I'm going to read from Psalm uh, 86 this morning, and it says this. It says, listen, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Protect my life, for I'm faithful. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to the cries for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there's no one, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name, for you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. This morning, Father, we pray that in this place, that wherever we find ourselves, that we would turn our attention, our, our focus, our eyes upon the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that in our distress and our troubles, that we would call upon you, that in whatever season we find ourselves, whether it be a great season or a poor season, I pray that we would turn and call upon the Lord because you are faithful, you are good. There is no one like you. There's none like you. There's no one besides you. There's none that even compare to the King of Kings. There's none that can compare to the great I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's none like you. So God, in our time of distress, we call upon you. In our time of prosperity, we call upon you. We give all glory to the King of Kings. We give all glory to the Lord of Lords. We give all glory to the great I Am. We magnify your name in this place. Be praised, be glorified. I pray this morning that the Spirit of God would fall in this place in a way that it never has before, that you would come and permeate this room, I pray, that you would come and saturate every seat, God, that you would come and just move upon the hearts of your people, Lord, that, God, you would come and convict us where there's sin, that you would come and free us where there's bondage, that you come and open our eyes where there's blindness, oh God, that you come and break down strongholds, oh God. God, I pray that you would move us to a place that we are able to praise you freely, to praise you willingly, to praise you without being dragged to do so, without being enticed to do so. I pray that you would teach us to worship from the depths of our soul, from the depths of our, our the heart of hearts within us, God, that we would praise you because you are worthy for no other reason, whether you've done a lot or you've done a little, that we would give you all glory and honor because it's due your name, Lord. You are the worthy one. You are the high and exalted one. You are the one who deserves all praise, all honor, all adoration, Lord. So in this place, I ask, Father, that you would be magnified upon the tongues of your people, Lord, that you would be glorified on the lips of praise from your people, O oh God. God, I pray that there is just spontaneous praise in this place as we think about your goodness, as we think about your grace, as we think about your mercy, as we think about your kindness, as we think about your favor, as we think upon all that you have done and all that you've yet to do, that you would be honored in this place with the sacrifice of praise that we bring before you, O oh God. Have your way in this place, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's just start our worship and praise out this morning like that. Sing to worship you, to worship you I live, to worship you I live, I live to worship you. Hallelujah, fill this room, Lord, to worship you, to worship you I live, to worship you I live, I live. Fill our hearts, Lord, to worship you, to worship you, I live, to worship you, I live, I live, to worship you. Lift your voices to worship you, to worship you, to worship you, I live, to worship you. 
Satan. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe, I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My name, my name belongs to you forever This is, this is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrites my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony. This is my testimony. Sing, come together. Come together, sons and daughters. Brought with blood and washed with water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. My God will finish what He started. Yes, He will, my God. My God. We'll finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll justify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my sing it out. This is this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony This is my testimony Let's sing this out If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Great things, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. I believe this is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'm justified. My Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'm justified. Cause Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Can we give him a praise and clap to this? Thank you, Jesus. My hope is built on 
The line who prays you in the storm just keeps on. Through the storm, he is Lord. Through the storm, he is Lord. I shared something with the team this morning about my husband and I struggled to have children. I had loss after loss, and we didn't know what was going on. And I was like, just like, Lord, what's wrong with me? And yesterday I was holding my daughter that I now have, my brand new baby, and for the first time I was holding her and I felt her heart beating fast. And I was just like, Lord, thank you for not letting me lose my faith through the storm, God. And so it just reminds me like through the storm he is Lord, you know, and it's it's just been such a sweet presence of God this morning. So if you're going through that storm right now, there's the other side. There, the storm always ends. Do not lose your faith. The storm always, always ends and there's always, always life. There's always a brand new heartbeat at the end of that storm. So let's sing that chorus again today. And if you're believing for the end of your storm, don't lose faith, because he is Lord. How great of a miracle, how great of a testimony will you have? 
It's even a greater miracle that you can still hold on to your faith through your storm too, right? So let's sing Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the Savior's love through the storm.
sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly buried.
To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. To our God. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice. To our God we lift up one song. To our God we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. 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 Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah is the highest praise. It is the highest praise. And this morning, Lord, we say hallelujah. We say hallelujah. We say hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
You know, if, you, if you've come in here with something on your heart this morning, if you've come in here with uh, feeling down or depressed or there's some type of struggle that you've had this morning, just start saying hallelujah. Just start saying hallelujah. And then you'll find that God comes in and takes that place. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. You know, I was, I was, I was watching this show the other day and was talking about the, the cornerstone of the White House and how the Freemasons might have put some, some time capsules in that cornerstone. And, and, and as I was watching it, I started to think about the cornerstone of the church, Jesus Christ. And in this, in this church, do you know that he has some time capsules in place? I don't know who I'm talking to today, but whoever's been waiting on something, whoever's been hoping for something, there's a time capsule about to explode in your name. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, that you're so good. Lord, that you thought about us way before time. Lord, when all was being created, when all was being done, Lord, you put a time capsule in our name in there. Lord, so that at the right time, at the right moment, Lord, it would be revealed. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for that one this morning that needs to hear that. Lord, that they would know that their waiting is not in vain. Because, Lord, you have seen them and you have already called it to be. And, Lord, we just love you and we glorify you, for you are holy. And this morning we cry, hallelujah, for you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. God is good. And all the time. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody good? Amen. Amen. Just a couple, actually a couple, couple announcements. Uh, Damascus uh, Road Motorcycle Run was supposed to be scheduled for today, but that's been canceled, and that's been rescheduled to um, August 6th. So the next Damascus Road Motorcycle Run will be August 6th. You can see our uh, brother Al Flood uh, quest if you want to get involved with that. The Pennington Seed Group, Monday, July 17th, that's this Monday at 7 p.m. We are in the book of Exodus, and I'm loving going through the plagues. Loving that, loving that. We have Aspire Sunday, July 23rd at Pastor uh, Justin and Lisa's house. Hallelujah. So all you Aspire people, that's right. I, I, meant, to, I meant to tell the worship team that they could re step down. But awesome. Sometimes this osmosis does it, Pastor Frank. Reaching for the Fringe Breakfast Fundraiser, July 29th. Tickets are on sale now. Uh, men's Retreat. Yeah, we got one guy. John, Johnny, why don't you come on up here and give us a quick update on what, you, what you're looking for for the men's retreat. Quick update. Men, a few minutes, that's it. Men, men, you've heard us talk about the retreat for the past few weeks. Well, we're getting close. They want an exact account in three weeks, which means we have today and next week. I always like to say, well, think about it. Well, it's, don't think about it. Just, just commit to it because I find... The fine guys, they think about it. I think about going, and then it comes down to, I think I should have gone. Well, it's too late. We want you guys just to commit, commit to, to a day and a half for your spiritual growth Amen. and fellowship with your brothers. It's a, it's a great time of, of, of just camaraderie and great messages, time together. We, we, we pray together. We, we cry together. We laugh together. We grow together. Amen. Uh, so all I have to say I'll be out, I'll be in the, the lobby after service. If you have not signed up, sign up, come and see me. And we are accepting our payments because time is short. Time is short. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll see you guys out there. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for John. Hey, listen, something that we're very excited about that's coming up um, really, really soon is our water baptism and clam bake. That's going to be Sunday, July 30th after service. Um, you can sign up in the foyer if you, if you bring in a side dish. Um, if you want to be baptized, then you can see Marissa. So all those that want to be baptized, please see Marissa, and uh, we'll make that happen. Amen. Amen. Can I have the uh, ushers come forward? 
Can we all stand as we pray? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you this morning that we have an opportunity to give to you. Lord, that we, Lord, we give from, from our little. But Lord, you don't look at the amount, Lord. You look at the heart. So Lord, I, I just pray, Father, that you would bless and Lord, you would bless those that give and those that couldn't, Lord, but desire to, you would still bless those. And Lord, and may the tithes continue to fill up your house. And Father, Lord, I just lift up that one here that's been waiting. Precious God. Lord, I pray, Lord, their time capsule would erupt today. Their name on it would erupt today. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you and we glorify you. We pray a blessing on these ties. We pray a blessing on your people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord some praise. I am so excited about that water baptism in clam bake. Um, we, we always had a, a wonderful time on our water baptism, and it's like, gee, why don't we do something different? And how many like a clam bake? Uh, I'm talking a real clam bake. I know some people are excited about it because before the, the Father's Day pig roast, Somebody called me up and says, all right, I got all the seaweed. All the seaweed's lined up. I'm like, this is Father's Day. This is pig. We're, the clam bake is another month away. But uh, I know we're going to have some great seaweed and uh, <laughs> clams and fish and all kind of food. It's going to be so good. And if you need to be baptized, uh, please see Marissa sign up for that, baptized in water. Okay, today is... Deacon Appreciation Day. Yeah. These are special people, and they do so much that you don't see and know about. So, deacons, if you're here, would you come and line up up here? Two missing, and I know one wasn't feeling well, and she would have come, but it's like, if you're not feeling well, just stay home, and um, you can enjoy it from online. Uh, anyway, these guys do so much. They are so active. They're so involved. They do so much behind the scenes that you just don't know about. Um, it's so fitting that we take a day and say thank you and show you our appreciation and love and one little day for all that you do all year long. Uh, they're the ones working behind the scenes. And, and frankly, this is a wonderful church to pastor because we have so many people that work behind the scenes here. Uh, but these are deacons, and they're mostly department heads, and they run different, different ministries. But we want to thank them. Donna, you start at that end. I'll start at this end. Thank you, Mark, so much for all you do. Kathy, thank you for all you do. You know, thank you for all you do, sir. Chris, <laughs> Michael, honey, <laughs> thank you for all you do, Donna. Marie. Thank you for all you do, Lori. Thank you, thank you, Paulie. Thank you. Now it would it, you're probably wondering. We have eleven deacons. Why in a church of one twenty? Thank you, guys. You can sit down. Of one twenty. Would you ever have 11 deacons, right, in a church of 120 if everybody showed up? And uh, the answer is, sim I mean, the whole early church, with all the thousands they had, they only had, what was it, seven? And uh, why 11? Why so many? And that's not counting all the elders, although some of them were double dipping. Some elders have their wives as as, as the, and that's a great thing. That's actually an example of what's intended. Uh, and the pastors and pastors sta and staff and the pastors' wives and all of the other department heads and workers and helpers and, and, uh, and, and 
you know, people that put their hand to the plow. How do you have so many in such a church of this size? And to me, I look at it as that's, that's our goal. That is our plan. That's our, that is our ministry. That's our niche. Every church has a reason. And that's one of them, because the reason for this church, one of them, is to take people and see a transformation in their life and to plug them into that plan that God has for them. What does God have for you? What is God's plan for you? What is his ultimate goal for you? It is not to get you saved and sit you in a nice, comfortable green seat and just, you know, sit somewhere in the back of the bus it is eventually to drive the bus. It's to work the door. It's to check the tires. It's to load passengers. It's to, it's to uh, Mark just asked me earlier, do we have any umbrellas? Because it started pouring, and he wanted to us, usher people uh, not only in here, but to their car and back with an umbrella. And uh, uh, We have to make a note of that, so Steph, so we can get some umbrellas. That's a great idea. I never thought of it before. And so all these things, it's, that's the purpose of our church. And deacons and is, is a tremendous step and milestone into making that happen. This is a garden of growth, and we grow by doing more than we grow by hearing. We grow by teaching more than we grow by being taught. Have you ever noticed that when, you're, when you get to teach something, how much it really gets into you and how much better you learn it? than when you just sit there and hear it. If you want to, even in, in school, I worked a little while as a tutor, and um, I tutored economics, because I was, I was good at economics. So they asked me to tutor. Well, as good as I was at economics, after tutoring it and explaining it and teaching it to others, I knew it so much better. The same thing with everything I've done in life. You, you'll notice when you start teaching it how much more you understand it because you've got to know it backwards and forwards. You've got to really understand it to be able to teach it more than just to hear it. And so that's the purpose of this, one of the purposes of this body. And it all can be entailed, everything we do, from the, from the hospital to the sick to the family to the army uh, construct of, of what sacred exchange is about, that trading process is all wrapped up in this creating of leaders and leadership and pulling people to their potential and finding out what is God's plan for you, what is God's call for your life, what did he design you to do before you were ever born, what was his plan and design for you, what is your purpose in the kingdom? Finding what that is and bringing you to it. That is the purpose of the church. That is the purpose of this church. That's what we're about. And so if we have 11 deacons, uh, which is <clears throat> close to, you know, 10%. That's, that's a big percentage number. Uh, not counting all the others that I mentioned. That's a lot. And it's not a lot because we, we don't have anything else to do. It's a lot because it's our goal and our purpose, and we're fulfilling that purpose. Um, we grow in grace as we work with people, and people are the hardest field. Okay, I've worked with wood, I've worked with metal. I welded a smoke pit and the thing works. Even though it's not finished, the fender's not on it past the west, we probably could get a ticket. But um, it cooks gribs, doesn't it? <laughs> that thing smokes. So we can, we can work with metal. I, I can, I've worked with wood. I've taken wood that other people thought was scrap wood. One of the best things I did in my career as a woodworker, my first year there, I would go out and scrounge around for wood. I'd get pallets, I'd get cheap wood and I would try to use that wood because I didn't have any money. And I'm starting out, it's the first year in business, and I don't want to eat cat food, so I'm scrounging around for wood. And there was an auction, and this big giant woodworking facility went out of business. They made big high-end displays in, in department stores. And I bought, for $2,000, wood that would fill this whole stage this high, front to back. I had nowhere to put it, I had so much wood. I bought beautiful Honduras mahogany and Brazilian rosewood. You can't even import it anymore. It's so special and beautiful. All kinds of exotic woods I bought. But it was all scrap <clears throat> that that big company 
when they got done with the job, they take everything that wasn't quite right, it wasn't perfect, wasn't smooth grain and straight grain, had a knot, had, a, had some figure, had some character, had something that would require them to put work and effort into. And it's like, eh, they threw it in a pile. And I bought it all for pennies on the dollar. And it changed everything in my woodworking career because no longer did I calculate things by <clears throat> how, how much is the wood. I calculated things by, look at this, and what can I make with it? Amen. What beauty can I make with this that someone else counted as scrap and put in the scrap pile because it took a little more time, a little more work, a little more effort, but its potential for beauty was so far beyond all the figure and grain and character of the wood and the different types, it took it to, a, I skipped like five steps and it took it to a whole nother level. Wood is hard, metal is hard. Stonework, I always have to ever come down Division Street and see those guys making that beautiful stone wall. I love, I think it's an art. Artists do great stonework. And I marvel at them, and I've done some stone work, and it's, it's stone, <laughs> it's, you know, but it's not beautiful like that. I marvel at the art that goes in, but the hardest thing to work with is people. Because people are, are we have ways. It's like a piece of wood with a hidden nail or a or green that just goes in every direction and you can't, you can't plant it, you can't cut it, you can't even scrape it. It's so difficult. People are the hardest thing to work and God puts us in a church and gives us opportunity to work with people because the ultimate, ultimate artistry, the ultimate goal of work is to work on people and in people and have an effect in people's lives. If you make the beautiful, most beautiful furniture, my, my motto used to be uh, furniture built to last as long as the tree it was made from. I still have that big carved sign in my shop. Well, it was quite a goal. I used to say, I'm gonna make you the furniture that your grandchildren are gonna fight over after you're gone and put everything into it. But that furniture's gone someday. Somebody's gonna paint it with ugly green paint because it matches their kid's room. And, and all that beauty is going to be gone. But what we do in the lives of people will never go. It never, it never goes away. It never fades. It is eternal. Paul said, you are my crown rejoicing. The crowns we get to heaven, one of them is, is the crown rejoicing. And he says, you are. You are my crown rejoicing. Nothing else is going to get onto the other side. That wonderful smoke pit isn't going there. I don't know how we're going to smoke ribs in heaven, Pastor West. We probably will if it's possible. I mean, Jesus ate fish after the resurrection, didn't he? After he was resurrected, didn't he eat fish? Broiled them. But that smoke pit isn't going there. Beautiful furniture is not going there. Only what is done in the lives of people is going to make it to the other side. Amen. And so we're about growing people, stretching people, working with people, trying to get people to be human people. It's hard with some of us. And it is our goal, and it is the highest goal. And so if we can learn to work with people, whether it's being an, as an usher or being a greeter or working on the cameras and trying to predict. I know what you mean, Mike, when you used to say, because once in a while on Thursday nights, I'll work the camera booth and pass the West, always goes this way. And he goes right here and half his time is right here. He never goes that way, he always comes this way. And so I just use two cameras because I've learned him. And you have learned me too, you've learned us all. But it's, it's so much fun. But so you're even learning people, even just running the cameras. But to deal with people in our hardness, 
in our self-centeredness, our selfishness, our ways that are just all about me, our ways that are just stuff comes out of our mouth like a razor and just takes a slash and takes a slash and takes a slash. And you never know when it's coming. You never know when that razor is going to come out and they're going to take a slash off you. And it's like, I thought we were good. I thought we were, had a relationship. I thought I, 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 I was mistaken. And you're taking a slash. And because we're working for the king and we're working and the master is trying to teach us and work things out in us. And always remember that. And everything we do in others, God is using that to work things out in us. And he grows us by putting us in a body with others and assigning us the task of doing a work and helping them and helping them grow and helping them to make it and to fulfill the, the potential that God has placed into them. But in all of that, he's using that to grow us, to grow us. And so when I'm in the kitchen and I'm washing dishes, which I try to help out in the kitchen as much as I can, but you probably never see me washing dishes because it is something I have a personal aversion to. I, I pulled mass duty so much in the Marine Corps, I, I, I do it if I have to. But I seldom have to. I find make a way. But if you see me washing dishes and everything's done, and all of a sudden somebody comes in that just you know, had to wait to the last minute and they come in after everything's clean and dry and they throw some dirty dishes at you like, 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 there you go. Like, you're my servant. And if you don't do this, I'll have you strung up in the courtyard. And it's like you want to say something, but you can't. What is God teaching? Is he teaching them or is he teaching you? He's teaching you. And he teaches us by what we do. And that's why you are my crown rejoicing. Because God is growing me. He's growing us by the things we do in people. And so, how does God grow us? People are the hardest field. How does God count growth and greatness? God does not count growth and greatness as a man. Let me read. I didn't even read our text yet, but let me read Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 through 11. Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but don't do after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. They lay them on men's shoulders, and they themselves will not move with one of their fingers, but all of their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad the flax trees and enlarge the borders of their garden garments. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and you all brethren. And call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted." How does God count greatness? Not as man. Man counts greatness as the marquee. We watch movies sometimes at home on my little folding computer, and we watched one the other night with uh, John Wayne. Of course, John Wayne is always first. But sometimes, you know, they always put who's going to be the first name up. And they made a big deal out of that. You can't put Jimmy Stewart before John Wayne as wonderful as a star as Jimmy Stewart was. And so the order of things, the marquee, whose name goes on the lights are the marquee. Whose name 
goes there. That's how man counts greatness. Man counts greatness as who comes up first on the movie credits. Man comes up, his greatness is who is the one that gets the credit? Who's the one in the lights? Who's the one that you see? Who's the one that you know? Where's that? That's how man counts greatness. Man counts greatness by where do I get to sit? Do I get to sit at the head table? Or do I get to sit at the table just off the head table? Or do I get to sit in the back table? That's how I count greatness. Where do I stack up in relation to? Wasn't that the beef that the disciples had after being with Jesus three and a half years, sitting under his teaching, listening to him, and they're still arguing who's going to be the greatest when you leave, and when you come into your kingdom, where am I going to be? Not as a servant, but at what table? Where's my name in the list? Am I in the Peter, James, and John inner circle? Or am I down there with Bartholomew and Thaddeus and Thomas? Where am I? That's how we count greatness. And the Lord counts greatness different than we count greatness. And he demonstrated this to him on the night in the upper room when they're arguing who's the greatest, and he, after supper, girded himself with a towel and stooped down and started to wash their feet. And he demonstrated to them, great is the servant that is the servant of all. And the higher you go, some people think the higher you go, you get the shiniest suit and you get to sit on the big throne chair and everybody comes and calls you something nice and, they've been, and you get the bigger paycheck and you get the bigger car and you get... That is not greatness in the kingdom. That's greatness in man's eyes. Greatness in the kingdom is the servant of all. Jesus was the greatest and he was the servant of all. And when he got done, all they had th that he owned was on his back and it was basically rags except for a robe. I heard one guy say what a beautiful robe it was. It was so special and wonderful because they gambled over it. And I always say if you know gamblers, that doesn't tell you anything because gamblers will gamble over anything. It doesn't mean it was wonderful and special and a nice beautiful robe because gamblers gambled over it. It just meant it was something that they could gamble over. And the next after they got done with that, they'd gamble over whose spit would leak down a mirror the fastest. Gamblers gamble over anything. Jesus, when he got done, had no U-Haul full of stuff, had nothing but a, what he had done for others. And so he said, he that's greatest among you will be your servant. It's not the name in lights. It's not who has the biggest church. It's not who has the biggest following. Corey Ten Boom told a story about someone who <clears throat> I'd never heard of him, so I didn't remember his name. But he was all over Europe traveling, and he went to one place, and he gave a speech, and people came from everywhere to hear his speech. And so after, somebody came up and said, doesn't it like affect you that so many people came and tried to get tickets and couldn't even get tickets to see you? Doesn't that like give you a big head? He said, listen, everybody came and laid down coats and palms in front of a donkey one day. Did the donkey get a big head? It wasn't the donkey. It was the one who the donkey served who was riding on him. And so I'm just a servant of Christ. So if they do that, it's not about me. It's the one who I serve who's riding, and I'm just the donkey bearing the burden. The accolades are not mine, the praise, the glory, the whatever. It's Christ's. And I need to remember that because sometimes we can get a big head because we'll do something in it, and it seemed like it worked good one time. So now to our text, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also be first proven, and let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. 
Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So in verse 10, it says, let them use the office of a deacon, right? In verse 13, those that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree. So the office of a deacon, the office of a deacon. First off, a deacon is a spiritual office of ministry. And we often think of deacons as like the temporal, right? In fact, our deacons are over temporal things. We have deacons over events, deacons over kitchen, deacons over ushers, deacons over greeting, deacons over all different things. And they're all those temporal areas. Even in Acts chapter 6, where they started first appointed deacons, they said, let us appoint these guys over this stuff so that we can dedicate ourselves to the word and to prayer. And so the deacons will handle stuff so we can be involved in this the spiritual side, the, the Mary work, and let them do the Martha work, okay? And so we think sometimes, oh, this guy's a, he's a great businessman. He's a wizard. Oh, he'd be a great deacon because he's a great businessman. This guy's a financial expert. He'd be a great deacon. He's a financial expert. This guy's the master carpenter. He'd be a great deacon. He could do all this stuff. And so we think on those lines, but deacons... That's not the way to get a good deacon. A deacon, the role of a deacon is a spiritual deacon, a spiritual person, a person rooted, grounded in the word, a person of maturity, a person that knows the word, a person that has a prayer life, a person that's family. They display things in front of their family and their family is working in well order. Nobody's family's perfect. Nobody's kids are perfect but you've got to have what you live will translate to them to some degree. And so the deacon, the office of deacon is a spiritual office that is, requires a spiritual heart to serve God. And all those other things can be pulled in and tapped in. You can get that. You can get consultants for all that other stuff, but you can't get a consultant to tell you about the love of God and putting him first and being a servant and having a servant's heart. No consultant's going to tell you that. That comes by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So that's the first thing. The office of a deacon is a spiritual office, a high spiritual office. It seeks a servant's heart. Number one, a servant to him, and number two, a servant to others. And he will teach the rest if we apply ourselves. Do you know all the years I taught, I still have books on teaching. I still buy books on teaching. I think I need to write a book on teaching because I'll probably learn more from writing the book than te reading the book. But I still keep immersing myself in this because it keeps bringing things. It keep, you keep learning. I, I've, I know one thing. I know one thing as sure as I know anything. The day you stop becoming teachable, the day you get to the place where you are so old that you know everything, you, you are no good anymore. Being able to be taught, being teachable, which being teachable means you hold things lightly. If I clamp down with all my might on everything that I think I know, I can't learn anything else because sometimes those things have to be improved. I have to learn them better. I have my cookbook. It's only this thick. There's only a few recipes in it because those recipes don't go into that cookbook until they, the first they're on scraps of paper. And when I repeat it over and over, and it's perfect, then I write it in the book. My pancake recipe, I can't tell you how many. I'd write it on the paper. It's like, oh, I'm going to try this. Let's try a little vanilla. Oh, let's try a little almond. Oh, let's put some oatmeal in it. Let's try this. More flour, more, the, more oil. One egg or two. How fluffy do you want them? <laughs> when I find the perfect recipe, it goes in the book, in ink. But then I hang around with guys like Matt. 
I have to be able to tear out a page. Because what I thought was perfect and written in ink, if I get to the place where I can't tear out a page or cross something out, if I can't do away with something that I thought and held as true, because I found something better, I am unteachable and worthless at that point. I know people very young, in their mid-30s, early 30s, who cannot be taught a thing because every, they, they know it all. They've done it all, they know it all. There's nothing more. And you can see it in their eyes. When you talk to them, you can see in their eyes. Brick wall. Brick, not even sheetrock. They can't knock through it. You ever go to those escape rooms? I've never been because it always, was it you who told me what they are? Yeah, because it always an escape room. Go through the wall. <laughs> Kick down the door. Smash right through the wall. It's only sheetrock. You can just smash right through the wall. And, and so, it, like, that's not appealing. <laughs> and then he told me, that's not, the, you have to, like, figure out cue clues. It's, a different, it's different than that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm thinking, like, Pastor List, they put you in a trunk. The new trunks have little things to get out. The old trunks, you can cut your way out. You know, there's, there's ways. But no, different. Anyway. I don't know how we went there, but let's go on. Use the office well. Make something out of an office. Um, it's not just a title. It's not just a name. It's not what you do with it. So the first thing to use the office well, and, uh, and we've seen this many times, is that sometimes you'll get a, a title. An office is a title. The office of deacon is a title. Elder is a title. Pastor is a title. You know, Grand Poobah, it's a title. It's just a title. What do you do with the title, right, of Grand Poobah? Do you, in fact, carry out the, the work of the Grand Poobah? Do you do the work of a deacon? Do you do the work of an elder? Do you do the work of a pastor? How do people look at you? You can put the big name tag on. You know, in fact, you can put one of those light-up name tags um, with all the little Christmas lights that go right around it, that blink and flash and light and everything. You can insist. No, you, you call me pastor. Why'd you call me Frank? Call me pastor, Frank. Right? Um, you can do all of that stuff, but you will be regarded for how you walk. You will re be regarded for how you do, for your behavior, for how you speak, for how your temperament is, for how you treat people, for how you walk by people and don't acknowledge them when you walk to someone else to acknowledge them. You will be remembered for that. And that will be the effect of your ministry, whether it says a deacon or an elder or pastor or anything. That's the effect. You take the title like a salesman puts his foot in the door and you work that title and you work it to where people regard, now that's a deacon. That's a deacon. That's an elder. That's an elder whether they have the title or not. There are certain people. There's one right over there, Elder Johnny. Elder Johnny hasn't been an elder for a, I don't know, a little while now. Look at Elder Tom, same thing. Look at Pastor Jenny, the same thing. I mean, these, these people, I'm looking around, these people are always that because a title was not something that defined them. They defined a title. Amen. Their lives made the title mean something. Right? Elder Debbie's not here. Here's another one. Everybody calls Elder Debbie Elder Debbie. She hasn't been an elder for several years now. But her life exemplifies what that means. And so you, you make the office, it's not about the title. The title is just getting your foot in the door. It's what you do with it. It's what I do with that ministry position, that, min oh, you're the, you're the executive director of, you know, taking out the trash and making sure the lid to the dumpster is not up just that much so they don't fine us $190. <laughs> right? We're getting another dumpster company as soon as the contract's up. But, so, so you're the executive director of, 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 of that. 
well, you're going to rest in that, or, or you're going to... It's about the job. It's about what we do. It's about working with people and working in people's lives. It's making something of the office. It's not the title. It's not the name. It's what you do with it. And some people never progress because they never do anything with the title. I get the title, and I sit on the title. It's what you do to make that title happen so that people look at you and see this is a minister, this is a servant. This is what deacon is about. This is what servant is about, not about titles. It says they purchased to themselves a good degree. That implies upward movement, right? Verse 13, when he says, for they have used the office of a deacon well, they purchased to themselves a good degree degree and great boldness in the faith that is talking about an upward movement it's talking about growth it's talking about going from a deacon to an elder we have that we have people here that have were deacons and they did such an exemplary job that everybody saw them and when they looked at them they didn't they saw elder and so when the nomination time came they just nominated these people that's an elder they didn't have to they saw it it came from people seeing what, God, what somebody was doing with the office that they had and using it to such a high degree that people just saw this and they, you're an elder. And people will call you that. People call you, 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 people called me pastor here when I was an elder. They would call me Pastor Frank all the time. And it's like I just shut my mouth. But people see things. And we have to operate in a capacity that they see things. That phrase implies an upward movement. Our goal is to facilitate God's growth plan in you. God's growth plan in you. Not your growth plan. God's growth plan in you. I talk about with this with Pastor Wes all the time. We look at different people. We say, what, you know, what is this person's calling? What is this person's call? Not desire, not intention, not what do I want. What is God's plan in this person or that person? What is God's call in their life? Some people, we want something for other reasons, and God has a call in our life. His call is the path I must follow. And when I follow God's path for me, I will be in the center of his anointing and blessing. Provided I, number one, walk straight. Some of us never achieve the greatness of the God's plan for us because we can't, we can't walk straight. We can't get beyond those initial things that keep tearing us down. We keep going crazy all the time and falling and falling and getting up and falling, and that's fine, but you're not going to grow into ministry and into fulfilling God's plan and purpose and calling in your life if you keep falling and getting up. You're taking the first steps over. You're doing your first works over and over again. You need to do those first works over and over again, but there's a time of maturity. That's why he says, don't anoint, don't lay hands suddenly on any man. That's why he says they must be proven. That's why it says, don't come to me, get a little time under your belt and then we'll talk. That's why. How's your living going? How's your Christian walk? Some people never get there because of that. They get derailed. Well, let me go on. Let me talk about something I've, I've talked about before. And it's in, it's in, um, why didn't mark these? The three calls. We've talked about this before. The three calls, and the first one is the call of acquaintance, and it happens in John chapter 1. And so the disciples, um, Jesus is just baptized by John. He doesn't really have his 12 yet. He's, he's, they're just, he's getting ready to pick them. And after John stood, and two of his disciples, John's disciples, and Jesus, they saw him as he walked, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him, and they followed Jesus. 
And when Jesus turned and saw them following, and said to them, what seek ye? Or what are you looking at? What, what, what are you doing? Who are you follow? Right? Um, they said, Rabbi, which is master, where do you dwell? And he said, come and see. And they came and they saw and they dwelt with him about that day for it was about the 10th hour. And then others followed. This is a call of acquaintance. They didn't really know everything about him. They knew what John said about him. They knew that he was going to do some stuff. They knew that he was special. And they wanted to go and they wanted to follow him. But it was their level of, of commitment to him was just as an acquaintance. They weren't totally committed to him. They just wanted to see. We want to hang out with you a lot. We want to, we want to see what's up with you. And so that was a good call. That's the first call. That's where we all come. It's a call of acquaintance. It's who is this Jesus? All right, let me check it out. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the call of acquaintance. The second call we find in Luke. Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass that the people pressed on him to hear the word of God, and he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and two ships standing by the lake, and a fisherman went out of them, uh, and they were washing their nets. And he entered one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the people out of the ship. And now when he left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. And Simon answered and said, Master, we, we toiled all night long. We've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their nuts broke. And he beckoned unto them, their partners that they were, from the other ship, that they would come and help them. And they came, and they filled both ships, so they were sinking. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the drought of fishes they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you will, you will catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. That's the call of exclusivity. They'd been with him. They'd been hanging out with him. They'd seen his miracles. They were following him. But they were still on their boats fishing. He was a side thing. He was something I go to on, oh, I, I go to church on Sunday. Sometimes I'll go on Thursday night. Oh, my goodness. If only we would go on Thursday night and hear the wonderful things that are done here on Thursday night. But it was a side thing. But this call is a call of exclusivity. At this call, he says, you know, you're going to be fishers of men. At this call, they forsook their nets. At this call, they left their business. At this call, it's I am hooking up with you. The first one is the first date, right? Acquaintance. We're going on an acquaintance date. I'm going to check you out. I'm checking out. Are you picking your nose at the table? If I turn my head, you pick your nose, I'm going to catch you, right? I mean, there's certain things you're going to do. It's like instant, like, oh, yeah, this is, let's, let's go. I'll just skip this rip. <laughs> you know? Acquaintance. The next call is a call of exclusivity. We've been dating a while, and I've checked you out, and you're pretty fine. And I think we should go like a step further. Why don't we go into, you're my girlfriend, I'm your boyfriend. When we get wedding invitations, we go together. We're not married, but we've made a commitment, and we are exclusive to each other, and you're mine, and I'm yours, and we're going to, Take this thing a little deeper and see where it goes. That's the second call. But the third call is in Mark chapter 3, 13 and 14. And he goeth up into a mountain, and he called unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he anointed them. And he, and, let me read it. And he goeth up into a mountain, called unto him whom he would, and they came to him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that they might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness and cast out devil. And then he named them all. This is a call of service. 
This is the higher call. This is where we go from being okay. We go to weddings together. We have boyfriend and girlfriend. We are exclusive to each other. We care about each other. This is where we make our accounts, joint accounts. This is where we change the title on the house. This is where we stand before the preacher and say, I do. This is where we enter an area of service. This is where things, this is, this is the highest level. We go from acquaintance to exclusivity to service. Those are the three calls that the disciples had to answer. And we talked about last time how in John chapter 6, verse 66, and after he said, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they forsook him. And it says, and all, they all left him. And then as he turned to the disciples, to the ones who had the commitment, and he said, are you going to go too? And he said, where are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? What level of call are you on? What level of call are we on this morning? Are we answering the call of acquaintance? And are we stuck in the call of acquaintance? Are you the one that I call every six months when I have a, a spare ticket to something and it's like, hey, you wanna go? Hmm? We're both nice, there's nothing bad gonna happen. You wanna go? Yeah, I'll go. We're acquaintances, we got nothing special going on. Yeah, I'll go. Let's go. You like uh, you like uh, ball games? I got a ticket for a ball game. Right? I don't like ball games, but if somebody like Donna called me up and say, "I got a ticket for a ball game. Want to go?" Like, yeah, I'll go. Cause you're nice. But then it goes to another level. That level of exclusivity. What level are we on? Well, because we cannot grow in the Lord if we're on the level of basic acquaintance. We are not going to grow and, and work our area of calling and, and, and service, right? We're not going to be anointed and work in that uh, if, if our level, if it's only the level of, of acquaintance. Some people can't get it because they, they, they can't walk a straight line. And they keep failing the sobriety test of my basic salvation. But other people can't get it because while they, they've been with the Lord a million years, they have never got beyond acquaintance to a commitment to be able to say, yeah, I can put some roots down. And when I put some roots down, I'm going to grow and be strong enough to help somebody else. When you go slipping down a hill, and, and it's muddy and you're trying and you start slipping down. You're grabbing every branch and tree and little blueberry bush. You're grabbing everything. And you're hoping that something has some roots to stop you from sliding down that hill. And you can grab a lot of dead sticks just laying there and they're coming with you and you let them go and grab something else and keep on sliding and let it go. When you can grab a hold of a bush, a tree that has some roots going down, it can hold you. And so if we're going to be in service, if we're going to make a difference, if we're going to be, you know, planting and you are my crown rejoicing, if we're going to make a difference, we're going to have some roots. People want to know I can grab onto you when I need you and there's some roots and stability there. You're not here today. You don't talk good, but walk bad. I have something in you. I see something in you that I can grab a hold of. And I know you're, you're rooted. You don't root. Growing on the bottom of the tire of my truck. Because that tire's always rolling. Moss doesn't grow on a rolling stone. And some of us can't get it because we keep not walking right. And some of us make no difference because we keep jumping around so much that we don't have a root in us. We have no roots. And we have no value. And we never get to the third stage, the stage of service and being fruitful. We can never make that difference. The difference where he called the 12 and he ordained them and he gave them power and he named their names. 
And they stood up and said, yes, I will serve. Yes, I'll serve as a deacon. Yes, I'll do the work. Yes, I'll take charge of, of this ministry. Yes, I will, I will birth this thing, and I will work this thing. And when it gets hard, I will stick it with this thing. I will make it grow. I will make it flourish. That is not easy. It's not easy in business. Most businesses go out of business the first six months. Very few make it two years. Very, very few. And it's the same thing with people starting ministries and, and, and wanting to do and wanting to do. Yeah, it's great to want to do, but try doing it. Try doing it when only three people show up. And week after week, and it goes from three to two. And keep putting the time in and making the calls and doing what it takes. And, and, and it's discouraging. And it's, you better have some roots to hang on to. And that's what he called them to. And that's what being a deacon is all about and being an elder. That's what ministry is. That's what service is. That's what the high calling is. Where are we in our call? Are you still an acquaintance? Have you come to a place of exclusivity? Are you putting down roots or ready to run? Ready to run. Oh, boy, it's raining. We got some roots. We're going to do good. <laughs> God has a great and wonderful plan for us. But all too often, those plans are limited by our accepting the call, accepting the call. Stand with me, if you will. There's not a person in here, there's not one of you that God has not ha have a call for your life, that God does not have a plan for your life. And frankly, he had that plan before you were born. And some of you have made an inroad and you've discovered him and you've come to him, but you've come on a kind of acquaintance basis. And there's no really commitment. And some have committed to Christ and have good roots and willing to do what it takes to be rooted and grounded. But that idea of serving, that idea of committing to ministry, to working it, to being here on, on that night that I had something else to do. Being, I had my lawn to mow, but oh man, I can't stop past the worst. I can't make it on Thursday because I gotta mow my grass. And, I, and all those other hours and days in the week, just they're different. So it's, I'm sorry. I can't be here hours early to get things right. I can't be here to help out on the wonderful clam bake that we're going to have in water baptism and fill that pool up and make sure that, you know, it's level. You know, last year we had to move that pool, drain it, and move the pool three times because we, now we know what a level ground is. And set up tents when nobody's here. Some people, you can't turn your back on them. They're here all the time working, doing things all the time. It's like, why don't you let somebody else do something? Where are you in the calls? I, 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 I plead with you. God has a plan for you. Step into that plan. Don't seek the title of it. Don't seek somebody else's plan or ministry or anointing. Find what God has for you and walk in it because it's the only thing that's going to make it onto the other side is what you do in this life for Christ and people. Father, have your way. I pray this morning. This altar is always open. I pray, God, your blessing on your children. I pray, oh God, that we hear your call. Do the miracle in front of us that we can say, as Peter said, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And let us, oh God, heed your call and step up to the plate, step up to the place that you have for us, God, and realize that is our purpose. That is our purpose. 
that is our purpose. And bless your children to heed and work in their call. And some of you I'm going to approach this week or next week, and I'm going to ask you to step up a little. Maybe it's to work as an usher. I'll tell you, one of the greatest things I did coming to this church is I got to work as an usher. And I was asked to work as an usher, and I'd already pastored 14 years at my last church. And I, 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 I don't know what I thought. I didn't think much. I said, yeah, I'll do it. I was so blessed to be able to work with like an elder Johnny and learn the ropes. I was so blessed because I got to learn every person's name and who you were and how you, where you like to sit and how you like to do. And uh, it was such a blessing, I can't tell you. And uh, even working the camera, although I did get out of counting. <laughs> but anyway, Father, have your way with your people. I pray your blessing in Jesus' name in this church. Have your way here in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you.